This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Robert Woodward, lawyer at Altador Law. He specializes in family law, wills, and estates for flame fans in Calgary and Southern Alberta. Call Robert at 403-771-2187 and mention Fireside Chat to get $100 off any legal service. Are you ready? Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, we're back. I'm Dan alongside Matt, and we'll get more into it later. But Matt, uh, the Flames have finally clinched the Western Conference in the Pacific Division. The first time since 1989-90 that we've uh, won the West. And since 2005-2006 that we've won the Pacific Division. So I guess we can just start the playoffs now, right? Well, it's a good thing that they managed to clinch the easy road for the playoffs. Right up to the Stanley Cup final, they will have home ice as far as they go. And that was what the first 79 games and the final three tonight and the next couple days are all about. But they haven't accomplished anything yet. And it's great that they did what they did, but they the clock gets reset down to zero on April 11th, and... It's go time, and the Flames will need to have their game going full tilt on those games, and just because they're going to be playing a mediocre team like Colorado, Arizona, or Dallas in the first round, that doesn't matter. Each team could win, and you look at uh, Chicago a couple years ago, they lost in the first round and were swept by Nashville, even though they were number one in the West. It can happen. And so it's great that the Flames did what they did, and it's nice that they clinched and got that out of the way so there's no headaches or potential Vegas matchup in round one. But they have to reset the button and let's go for game one. Um, Nice to kind of know that we've clinched the West. I mean, that's something we haven't done in a while. A um, lot of talk about what banners the Flames should put up. Do you think they should go the Nashville Predators route and put up regular season Western Conference champions banner? Uh, I think San Jose did the same thing as well. I think San Jose's taking theirs down. I think Nashville did too. And Did you ever see the video yeah. when Vegas mocked them about it? Uh, yeah, I did. And especially with a, an expansion team, I can kind of understand the desire to have something in the rafters because they didn't really have anything but yeah they kind of went overkill on that i don't expect the flames i think you'll see pacific division champions and maybe stanley cup i wonder if you can combine two on one banner pacific division and western conference regular season champions we're not edmonton we don't need to you know over pump we're running out of room on that air bench we can't put too many more banners up there Yep. Maybe that's how we know it's time for a new arena. Hey, we're out of space in the air vent. Somebody go break some ground. Let's go. Move it. Yep. Need a bigger air vent. That's right. Uh, well, let's talk about last week's games. This is where all the magic happened. This last week is how the West was won, if you will. Uh, we recorded last week during the LA game, but this game hadn't got away from the Flames yet. Um, Calgary lost last Monday 3 nothing to LA. Uh, Shout out for... A very unlikely goaltender for L.A. You usually think of a shutout going to quick, but this one went to Jack Campbell. I think the only thing I can say about this one is Jack Campbell uh, stood on his head here. Yeah. Like, if you look at the shots, I think the Flames had something like 47 shots in the game. And you're going to run into goalies. 42 to 20. uh, Yeah, there you go. I knew it was an absurd number. And you're going to run into goalies that stand on their head. And... The Flames should have won that game, but they didn't. And does it matter? Not really. Because LA had just beat San Jose a couple days prior, so it didn't really make any difference realistically. It's just more frustrating because you'd like to get the Z by the team name as fast as possible. I don't have much else to say about this game besides good for Jack Campbell. How about you? Yeah, and then we saw Quick the next night get shelled by the Oilers, and 
that was more indicative of how the Flames game went, too. It's just the goalie stood on his head, and it is what it's it is. It's kind of funny they saved Quick for the Oilers. Well, Quick's kind of fallen off the map entirely, and... Like, frankly, I wouldn't be shocked if this contract he's on is his last in the NHL. It, 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 he's just too banged up injury-wise, and I just don't know how long he has left in the NHL. Because we got some how... flack for our Dubnik predictions last week. People said Quick would be a better bet. I don't want to touch Quick with a 10-foot pole. No. Even if he was free, no thanks. Well, if he's free, you can send him to the AHL, get him to mentor somebody down there. Well, free acquisition. Oh, yeah, okay. You still have to pay his contract, but I yeah, maybe just I volunteer touch. to be our like emergency goalie. Yeah. Um, Constant state of emergency. Well, if you have Quick as your starter, you're pretty much in that. True. Uh, next game that the Calgary Flames played. This was the last of their home stretch here at the Dome. Uh, the Dallas Stars came in, and what we thought could be a playoff preview. And Kadobin ended up replacing an injured Ben Bishop in this one, and the Flames still couldn't win even after Bishop went down. Stars won two to one against the Flames. The only goal going to TJ Brody. The Flames were kind of lackadaisical in this one, and again they still had the six point lead at the time, and they didn't put a ton of effort into the game. They were kind of lazy we, until the last couple minutes when the, they scored their one goal and they nearly tied it after that. We've seen this, I think, a few times this season where they get a big loss and then the next night they just don't seem to care. Yeah. And it's understandable that with their situation, like they didn't really need to go all out. And plus, with your, when you're playing Dallas, you're playing a team that you might end up seeing down the road. It's possible that Dallas could work their way to the conference finals, and if the Flames make it there too, then they're, they have a book that, oh, this is what you're going to expect. So them not really playing that great, it might be a little bit of a fake out as well in terms of making, you know, because Dallas has won the last six meetings between the two teams, like kind of like pump up Dallas's ego a bit. In case we meet them. Yeah, I don't know if they went that far with it. It reminds me of earlier in the month when we lost to Toronto 6-2 to two, and then we went on the road for two games and lost Vegas 2-1, to one, Arizona 2 nothing. Seems like after that big win, Calgary kind of went into a bit of a funk. And they, they seem to be doing that at times this year. They have a loss they shouldn't have, and the next game they just seem to not care. Yeah. And that happens with every team like that. It's not that big of a deal. And then the next night, probably the uh, the big game for the week, besides the San Jose game, the one that we were all waiting to see what would happen, Sean Monaghan comes back after his drought and gets four points as the Calgary Flames beat the Anaheim Ducks 6-1 to one on retro night. Yeah, well, uh, Monaghan had expressed some frustration with himself prior to the game uh, uh, the previous day and saying that he needs to be better and... Four points, that'll do. We have some dressing room audio coming up in a minute here of Sean Monahan talking about that. Uh, some notes that I had here. Geo's goal in that first period, I had noted that it was actually not assisted by just Monahan, as the score sheet says. It's actually assisted by Pizza 73. Because if you take a look, he won times off the after the Pizza 73 ad passed it to him. It was Monahan to Pizza 73, Pizza 73 to Geo, and he scores the big pepperoni goal. I don't know. There's got to be some sort of advertising there. but um, The second goal there, the Sean Monaghan goal, I still think that that's, uh, that was Anderson's goal. I mean, good for Monaghan for getting it in there. Monaghan just helped helped it along, if you will. Yeah, um, true enough. And then the too bad for Monaghan didn't end up getting the sh- the hat trick after all after his last goal in the third people threw some hats on the ice but James Neal uh got credit for Monty's second goal in the second period after all I asked Neal in the dressing room afterwards this mean he gets a third of the hats he said he didn't want them <laughs> <laughs> I can't blame him so no. I thought hey that's only fair right he did a third of the work he get a third of the hats that people threw but never have I seen somebody throw hats in the ice for two goals before yeah, um, I I actually have that happened to uh, 
I think like 2008 or nine or something like that. And it was a similar situation where one of the goals was credited to somebody else, but it, it has happened. It's just a very bizarre set of circumstances. I thought James Neal looked pretty good in this game considering he was on the third line. He kind of did everything he needed to. He got a goal out of it. I thought he's coming around, but interesting to note that both Hathaway and Ryan have more goals this year than James Neal. Well, Neil has struggled all season, but I think that that was partially him conserving energy, I think, a bit until games actually mattered, because ever since he's returned from injury, he looks like James Neal that we've seen over the last, like, 10 years. So, it, just that physically feisty guy who hits everything and chips in some offense, so... If he can keep that going moving forward, that will bode well for the team. And he looks like he's ready to go for game one. I think one of the keys to victory for the Flames here is they did a good job of staying out of the penalty box against Anaheim. The last couple times we've taken them on the playoffs, we've started to get down because we gave them a man advantage too often. And this one, Ducks had six penalty minutes and we only had two. And I think that was a big key to victory here. Yeah, and... and Anaheim likes to be in an annoying team and kind of get... They play kind of like how Kachuk does, where they just do little chintzy things that irritate you, and it's enough to throw the flames off of their game most nights. And the flames didn't bite on any of those things, and I think the Ducks are more looking like they're going to be going into a full-scale rebuild moving forward because I I don't think they're going to be the same Ducks team at all, and I think they're going to They got a lot of contracts change. that'll be tough to move. Yeah, I think they're going to be trying to insert more young guys in and hope that they get something out of the deal, but it's going to be a long road for the Ducks to return to the postseason. I don't think it's a three- or four-year deal. No, I, I think they're they're not going to be that mighty for the next couple of years. Yeah. Um, I made a note here. Maybe this is kind of, I don't know, not a good thing to say, but for as long as I can remember, Mike Smith did not get an, an assist for the other team. Seems like every time Mike Smith's in net, he cost the Flames a goal, either by playing it behind his net or not getting back in time. And he didn't, uh, this is the first time in a while I can remember him not doing that. Well, um, Smith has been fairly good frankly uh since the beginning of the month that again the banner night yeah game. but he still had uh, some some lapses behind his own net or oh to play of course too much. And, yeah but uh, if you take a look at the next game that we're going to be profiling that was why you have mike smith because a team like san jose they dump the puck in and they go and get it and you have Mike Smith there, he just gets the puck and then fires it right out of the zone or up to one of the defensemen and you're on the back out. And San Jose only had 14 shots in their game uh, yesterday. And that was due in large part to the Flames just basically neutering the Sharks' attack entirely. And we saw that last month when he played the New York Islanders in both games, he, the Islanders just had no secondary options uh, to generate offense. And especially when the Flames go into the postseason, having a guy like that, if the other team does play that kind of a game, the Flames could deploy Smith and have him just interfere entirely with how they do things, and that might bode well for the team in that series yeah i can see what you're saying a couple more notes here before i wrap up this game i thought prout and brody looked like a good unit together anderson looked really good on the first pairing seeing brody on that third pair it makes me wonder what it sort of means for brody's future and maybe trade value going forward i mean you don't generally jump that far down the lineup well the flames are a bit of a weird team in that the, they have like 10 top six defensemen. So it you got to, you know, like you can't break up Hamannick and Hannafin because they have good chemistry with each other. So it's either the first pairing or the third pairing for you. And with Anderson showing some ability to play on the first unit, why not 
you know, it does suck, but there's no other option for Brody. And then talking about Anderson there, I kind of went back and was reflecting on the team this week. Remember that Anderson was actually cut out of training camp. The only reason he came back was Hamannick broke his jaw early defending um, Dylan Dubé in a fight, so he got recalled. But this is a guy who's yeah. playing on our first pair and, and he wasn't even supposed to be here. Oh, I know. And then Stone got uh, hurt with the blood clot thing, and he remained up for the rest of the season. And, it, you know, full marks to Rasmus. He's done everything that the team has needed, and he's emerging as a potential top-pairing defenseman moving forward. Well, let's move on. And, like, once he gets his slap shot going on a regular basis instead of just occasionally, I, I could see him potting 10, 15 goals in a season. Yeah, I think that would be a bonus. I think he's a good defenseman as he is. He doesn't need to be an offensive guy, but that would be a bonus if he can get it going. Yeah, because he really does have one heck of a clapper there. Well, should we talk about how the West was won? I I guess so. And by the way, that is a good movie. Yeah? Yeah, if you haven't seen For it. For some I'd... reason, when you first said that, I was thinking Wild Wild West with Will Smith. That was a terrible movie. Yeah, that really, really was. Um, and a terrible song, too. Uh, uh, yeah. I think uh, that movie was done in, like... I want to say like 1960 or something like that. How the West was but won. Yeah, yeah. There, Matt's movie pick for the week. Yeah, movies are one of my other areas of interest. So yeah. So, but that's neither here nor there. So the Flames hopped on a plane and went for the first game of their last road trip of the season, their California road trip, and Sunday night, last night, took on San Jose. I've been saying, as you know, since at least the beginning of the month, this San Jose game was going to be what it all came down to. That was going to be for all the marbles. And people didn't believe me, but turns out I was right. I got to polish my uh, my crystal ball, I guess. And when when push came to shove, Calgary ended up winning 5-3 to three over the San Jose Sharks with Mike Smith and Nett. This secured them the Western Conference number one. This got them the Pacific Conference win. This is for all the regular season marbles right here. Yep. And they went out and completely dominated the San Jose Sharks in their own barn, limiting them to only 14 shots. And that's the second best team in the West. Considering it's April so, Fool's Day, I thought about tweeting today that San Jose has been disqualified from the playoffs for allowing a Dalton Prout goal. Yeah, well, that's not really fair to Dalton. He did a good job on that. So the f you know it reminds me of uh, n former number six Corey Sarich having a goal kind of like that like ten years ago, and it's like um, how did you do that? Because it was Sarich at the time, and s same thoughts with Proud. It's like um, okay, where did that come Better from? Better <laughs> late than never, right? His first goal is yeah. a flame. I think his first goal since like twenty fifteen or sixteen. Yeah. So the flame. And by the way, that movie was 1962. Okay. So I was like a little off. Now you got to figure out how many guys in hockey ops in this organization were born when that movie came out. Maybe three. <laughs> Berkey's not here anymore, so probably nobody. Yeah. Um, so fl True enough. Flames get goals here from Monahan, his 34th of the year. Jankowski, his 12th of the year. Proud, his first ever. No, his first since a few years. Uh, Backlund's 21st and Froelich's 16th. So the Flames really lit up the Sharks here, and uh, they made the rest of the season mean absolutely nothing. Yeah, so next week's game's recaps is basically, okay, we lost or won or whatever. Who cares? Who are we playing? <laughs> so Matt, we got nothing to talk about. I figure we'll spend the next hour just chanting we're number one. Ready? We're number one. We're number we're one. We're number one. We're number we're one. We're number one. All right, let's 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 actually talk about some other Flame stuff. Nobody wants to hear that. Yeah. Um, it It's nice, though. Like, I... I can hardly remember the last time the the flames were number one in the west maybe we'll put out a bonus episode it's just us chanting for an hour yeah just you know cut out that thing and just hit repeat for an hour and there that's you go that's what our editor's gonna do peter if you're listening you can make us our bonus episode there you go yep um well let's i guess let's look ahead to what might be coming in the playoffs. And if we take a look, it looks like our most likely matchup is going to be the Colorado Avalanche. You and I have talked a few times about how this is probably one of the least scary teams here um, and probably one of the best options we could hope for. 
Yeah, realistically, it's not likely that Dallas loses out and like either Colorado or Arizona catches Dallas, and so it's going to be either Colorado or Arizona. And frankly, I'd kind of expect Arizona to not make the playoffs just because they're behind and Colorado has an extra game to play, but they do Arizona does have the tiebreaker, so it's a little up in the air but each team like if you combine the strengths of each team they'd probably be the best team in the league it's just that you know the avalanche they can score a lot but they have no defense and goaltending and arizona can't score but their defense and goaltending is pretty good so if you if you look at colorado they've probably got the best one two goalie pairing going into this with uh Grubauer and Varlamov. I think both of them are serviceable, but I'm not scared of either one. And I'd honestly take Smith and Riddick over the pair of them. Yeah, uh, at least we know with both those guys what they can do. They've both been to the playoffs before. True. Um, but I think, to me, the real key to victory here is shutting down that McKinnon, Ranton, and Laniscog line. And because we have the first two games at home and we get last change, I think the answer is just throwing 3M out against them. Yeah. Just do a good tape job, you know? Get the 3M line out. It, and... it might be a little bit more difficult on the road because they'll get last change, but I, I think as long as you don't put our first line against their first line because then you got no defense from either team. Yeah, that'll be an adventure. Yeah, like looking at the two goalies for Colorado, like uh, Varlamov has a 286 goals against average, Grubauer a 269. And uh, nine ten and nine sixteen respectively for the save percentage. So not they're about league average. Yeah, I, I don't think either one's average. a great goalie, but I just think that you know if no. if one falters, you've got another one who can do it. And there's not a lot of teams that can say that. Calgary, Colorado. Um, there's not a lot of teams that would want to or would feel comfortable playing both their goalies in the postseason. Yeah, and looking up front, uh, they have a decent first line of course with McKinnon, Rantanen, and Landeskog after that it's you start getting into more of like the Flames third line level of players and down Alexander Kerfoot Kompfer, uh, Matt Calvert like the okay players but not well that's anything that's why to, they're in a wild card spot right if you were a good yeah. if you were a good solid team from top to bottom you'd be at much higher in the standings Oh, for sure. And if the Flames can sick the 3M line out on the Avalanche's first line, like Colorado probably would win a game or two in the series, but I don't see them having enough to win four. I think going into this, Calgary can probably get some big wins at home if we can neutralize their first line. I think we might struggle a little bit in Colorado just because we won't have that last change and it'll be a matter of just making the right changes on the fly. I can see Colorado winning one, maybe two at home, but I think it's going to be a six game, five or six game series. Yeah. Basically the way I look at it, two, nothing heading there, then a split and then the flames winning when we come back. Could be like, that's kind of, if that's how it goes, I think that would, and Frankly, with Arizona, if that's who we end up playing, I think that that's a four, maybe five game series just because they have no offensive weapons at all. And They're not like much of a goaltender win, either. No, and they only win a game if their goaltender stands on their head for that one night. And yeah, uh, it's a complete mismatch. Yeah, I think ideally it would be Arizona. I don't think that's going to happen, though. Looking at the other teams, I didn't want Dallas. Um, no. I think the goaltending there with Bishop when he gets hot is, as you mentioned, we've, we've lost the last six to them. So not Yeah, and one. Hudobin's underrated, I think. So, like, he can be really good when that's he wants to be. That's another team that's got two guys that they'd probably be okay running. Yeah. And I think that's about it, really, for For the two West, team, anyways. Two goalies, yeah. Frankly, I think that the representative of the western conference will be either calgary san jose or El uh, las vegas um i don't see any of the central teams because if you look at uh, 
those teams like they each have their own unique problems and they're just there's too many holes on each of those teams that i just don't see it would be a little weird like they'd have to have like their goalie stand on their head to get through uh, i just i don't see like looking at like the most complete teams it's the three from the pacific division i could see i could see st louis surprising yeah i, I could too f- I, I i that's actually kind of who i'm penciling in as the conference finalist actually so we're on the same page oddly enough i think just because they had such a struggle this season but when they put their minds to it um, yeah. They came back and they were able to, um, you know, they were able to, to get quite high in the standings. They were last place for a long time. Yeah, I know. And they're not that far away from winning the division. Even They did what Edmonton couldn't go from last to a playoff spot. They've got 92 well, points Edmonton, and Edmonton Winnipeg did has one got year. 94. Yeah. And they're winning right now. So you're going to have a three-way tie for first place. In the central with ninety four points, so yeah, it's yeah, it it's one of those. I think that St. Louis could, I that would be the team I'd pick from the central to beat everybody of those four teams. Yeah, see, and this is the thing too. Like we, you know, we we're saying that they'll probably put up a Pacific Division champions banner. To me, you're really not the Pacific Division champion until San Jose and Vegas are out true like you're the well it says for a regular season yeah but, but that's still that regular season banner like you kind of get away even if you don't eliminate them you're last specific team standing i know well i think you'd only do that if you're you remove the wild card and it's just top four in each division and go at it because like right now you got five central teams in the playoffs so it's a little weird. Yeah, no, but... I mean, I know they won't do that, but to me, that's truly the champion of the, of the division is when you're the last team standing. Oh, I agree. You know, like, that's that's how we know that, okay, this is this is the real champion. They're the last ones that we're playing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. But, you know, it's, it's a nice spot to be in, and, uh, you know, having... Well, that's why it was so important for the team to have a good start to the season which they were kind of okay at the start but like i think there were 500 through their first 10 games but in normal years like the flames are usually like three and seven at that point so you know just having that decent enough start and then being able to accelerate through certainly helped and them being in the driver's seat like now they're the the team to beat and they're the most complete team and usually in the playoffs the most complete teams end up going the furthest uh but it they just made their road a lot easier and that's the name of the game and like that's the thing i've been harping on for years is that they need to be able to dictate the play instead of oh well i guess we're playing san jose or you know whichever team because you know that that's where one of the lower end seeds and okay well i guess that'll do and you know then you're out in the first round and (laughs) you know but now the flames have an opportunity to get a relatively easy opponent and maybe be able to push forward instead of being on the defensive. If you look back, you and I were concerned coming out of the China games. This team didn't look great, but listening today to an interview with uh, GM um, Treliving, Brad Treliving, he said that those, he thinks those China games and being, especially with a new coach, having the guys so close together for so long was really one of the things that he thinks changed the season around. You got to remember we were long out of a playoff spot last year. Like these guys fizzled 84 points. Yeah, These guys, it's not like they were two points out. These guys were not a playoff team last year. So to go from not being in contention to being number one, that's a big accomplishment. Yeah. And to me, 
like based on the personnel moves in the off season, like they got rid of most of the trouble people and replaced them with actual NHL talent. And with the top half of the team being so good, they just needed to do that to go from 84 to now 105. And this is why depth matters. And like, that's why you see teams like Edmonton struggle uh, and Buffalo even because like okay you have your one or two flashy stars and they do a great job but then there's nobody else and then they struggle because there's nobody else and Calgary's been receiving offense from all four lines and like even in that last game all four lines scored a goal and that's key to being able to win a Stanley Cup is having a team that you don't know which line to defend the most because each line can do damage and that's what makes me hopeful for this postseason because of the fact that the flames are such a dangerous team that maybe they might be able to go far just because of that this season right from the beginning of the regular season just had a different feel to it if we look back in the first five games calgary won three they won a 7-4 win at home over Vancouver. Then they won 3 nothing over Nashville. Then they won 3-2 to against Colorado. 5-2 to over Boston. 5-3, to or no, they lost 5-3 to, to uh, Nashville. And then there was that big, if you remember in the first month, that 9-1 to slaughter at the hands of the Penguins. Yeah, and, and that was like the third game in a row that they were terrible, and like it just culminated in. Yeah, that. They, well, they lost uh, Nashville five three. They they won against the Rangers four to one. They lost to Montreal, and then the Pittsburgh win, and then they lost to Washington two days later. But to me, when I look back and being in the room and hearing from the coach and stuff after that game, to me, I think that's where things turned around. Yeah, it's like. Uh, Guys, get your head out of your ass so that way, you know, you don't blow the season like last year. And, you know, when you're ha struggling that much as they were. And to be fair, Mike Smith was horrible in the first month and a half of the season. And that was, I think he was just having a very hard time adjusting to the new equipment standards. Uh, but he has since gotten better obviously and hopefully uh his, his good play of late carries on because he's actually been quite excellent and i think he'll be the game one starter for the flames in the postseason you and i talk year after year about how it's almost not even worth podcasting until christmas time because this team doesn't seem to get their act together. It's way back in the Jerome McGinn era. He wouldn't come alive till Christmas. And I think one of the biggest differences this year, these guys were ready to play when the regular season started. And that's like how often one are we trying things... to make up twenty points at Christmas time? Oh, it, like we were basically relying on that seven game winning streak just to hit the the reset, just button. to get to five hundred. Yeah, and the Flames. Like, that's one of the main things that I know I've harped on and I know you've harped on is getting a good start so that way you're not behind the eight ball and then playing catch-up all year. And the this is the first time, really, that, that I can remember that they started well and then carried forward. And, well, you're seeing it, the end results of that. First in the conference, first in the division. I mean, you look at last year, they got hot from Christmas right up until, you know, the break, and then they fizzled out and looked like they did at the beginning of the year. Yeah, well, I think uh, from uh, the All-Star break, or whenever their uh, trip with the Oilers to Mexico, they were the worst team in the league. And That's what I mean, after that, they, they after played that bye like week, it. they were terrible. Yeah, and... Uh, that's where the season went. And, and even I this year, we like, started to see that happening, and somehow they managed to sh shake it off. Well, that's where depth comes into play. And the first line played poorly for basically all of February, and they were non-existent. And it was the third and fourth line that carried the offensive load and drove the Flames to having a very successful month of February and an even more successful month of March. And 
it was the depth that got it done. And that was the thing that the Flames were lacking last year, where we weren't getting any offense from the third or fourth line. And so the first line goes cold. Okay, well, we're losing because we don't have anything else. How much of that do you think we can attribute to the personnel on those lines? And how much do you think we can attribute to the coaching staff? It's... A little bit of A and a little bit of B. Uh, I think that like upgrading uh, Stajan to Derek Ryan was huge, and that's not a slight to Stajan. He did a good job for a fourth line center. It's just that Derek Ryan on most teams is a third or a second line center, and the emergence of some younger players like uh, Andrew Mangiapane and uh, Garnett Hathaway. Both has those guys helped. were in the lineup last year, though. True, but they weren't being used properly. Like, Glenn Gullitson did not allow Hathaway to hit much at all, and that's how he generates offense. But see, that's what I mean, though, is was it the way these guys are being used by the coaching staff? Like, how much of just the change in the the way they're being used or the way they're being asked to play has attributed to the team being better? And that's where it's a little bit of A and a little bit of B. Like, we got clear upgrades in personnel from guys like Ryan and guys like Lindholm and Hannafin. But then you add in the coach who actually uses the players properly based on the skills that the players have instead of trying to pigeonhole them into their system like Gullitson did. If we had this lineup with Glenn Gullitson behind the bench, I think we would have to be a playoff team. Like I... Honestly, I think the Flames probably have about 92 points right now, if that. Yeah, well, I th- looking at where things are in the playoff race, I think that would put them in there. Uh, what have we got? We got 93 points for Carolina. So, yeah, they'd be right on the verge of a wild card spot. So it's it's definitely partly the personnel and partly the, the coaching staff. Yeah. Uh, they'd be in a the dog fight. With, like, all the other teams and you, in San Jose would uh, clearly have won the division by now and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it That coach was perhaps the single worst coach the Flames have ever had. Do you think so, he'll be the last uh, guy left in Edmonton who has to turn out the lights after everyone gets fired? Like, what do you think the probability is he's the next Oilers head coach? I am hoping for that. Because how fitting the single worst coach in our history going to Edmonton to be their coach. I that you couldn't script it better as a Flames fan. I don't know. I think Gilbert's the worst head coach that we've had, but uh, it he did all right based off of what he had. He just had a personality issue with Savard, and I, I think it, I think you're gonna see everybody you know. fired Edmonton the day after we play them, and I could see like Gullitson was in the bathroom when everyone got fired, so they forget to fire him. So he's like head coach by default. Yeah. Or he was his kid was sick Nobody, that day, so he was at home. I'm not here. He just comes to know. the rink the next day. Where is everybody? He sits down in the head coach's seat, and everyone just assumes he's the new coach. Yep. There's no GM to tell him otherwise. Exactly. So yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Um, thinking and and we mentioned the forwards and some of the changes there. You mentioned Mangiapane and stuff. We can't discredit the changes on the blue line. I think that to me is where this coaching staff has been. The biggest help here is I don't think Anderson, I don't think she'll. Well, this actually comes right from management, and uh, this was actually a disagreement between Brad Treliving and Brian Burke, uh, because uh, Treliving wanted to insert some of the younger defensemen in, and Burke was more you know older school where you know the, the defensemen have to learn at the A level and. With Berkey leaving, that allowed the Flames to just do what they wanted to do. And I think that Anderson, Shillington, and Valimaki have kind of played okay this yeah, year. Yeah, well, I think it's also Ryan Husko, who's been known as a really good development coach. He was all three of those guys coached in Stockton last year. So there's some familiarity there. And I think the combination of those guys coming up and Huska being brought up, I think together it was. I don't think one would have been as successful without the other. I agree. And having those guys up here, like, frankly, the Flames' defense for the next eight, nine years, I think, is pretty much good to go. Uh, Between the three kids that we drafted and Hannafin, like, you're pretty much good for a while. And 
hopefully like with the expansion draft we don't lose any of them and we can just carry on but i think that the team is basically set f on defense for a while and it'll be nice in the upcoming draft to get some more guys but it's one of those things that the team has done a masterful job with utilization of everybody and i like the fact that tonight we're going to be seeing all of the, all of the young defensemen playing and in prime well, spots not all of them. to Hannafin's see out. yeah true it's enough. weird we um, think of him as a veteran because he's been around for a while the guy's only 22 i know he's younger than anderson yeah and uh, which but is like when weird. i think of our young defenseman i don't think of him like that because he's been around the league yeah well like you look at uh, uh manjapani is older than sam bennett so you know i think everything's relative but yeah, I, th I think, you know, this roster has been great for us. Like you mentioned, we had some goalie troubles early that we thought might derail the team. I mean, I remember you and I having conversations of, you know, what do yeah, we, what well, do? Yeah, well, it was basically a foregone conclusion that the Flames needed a goalie at the deadline until Smith got better. And Smith got better. Mm -hmm. And he's rebounded to the point where he's basically the same guy he was last year. And... I have no problem with him playing uh, at all. So it that's instead of being like the number one problem, it's like, oh, yeah, I guess. But we have two guys that are pretty good, so it doesn't really matter anyway. If we look back at some of the flame seasons, let's go back to 0304 when they lost in the finals. How many of those years when they've made it, which would be 04, uh, 05, 06, 06, 07, 07, 08, 08, 09, and then 14, 15, and 16, 17, kind of what was your feeling, do you remember, going into each of those seasons? And were you ever as sure about the team as you are now, or was there ever a year you were maybe overly sure and they really disappointed? Well, I think it, like in 03, 04, uh, I was at all of the Flames games that year, and uh in the postseason and basically everybody was just kind of happy to be there and the flames had a seven-year drought at that point and like uh, the players i know aginla uh, sp specifically was just happy to be in the play playoffs for a change and there was no expectations on us to do anything and like I even remember uh, saying that, hey, at least I get to go to see two playoff games this year, and like, how long has it been to just see two playoff games? And maybe we might get to see another one. And then we beat Vancouver, and it's like, uh, what? <laughs> and so on and so forth, all the way down. It was more like, how are we doing this? More than anything, like there was no expectations of anything. Like, I think everybody basically expected the Flames to maybe play five or six games in the first round, be bounced by Vancouver, and call it a good season. And instead, they went to Game 7 of the Stanley Cup Finals. So, like, that year was just bizarre. Uh, there, w there were no expectations of any of that. And I think that's why the 4 run was so organic in terms of the celebration of the city because it was kind of an out of nowhere hey this is awesome well not uh, just out of nowhere you look at the roster i mean it's almost like from toy story the island of the misfit toys like it was a bunch of extra spare parts we acquired from all over the league yeah it was basically like if you had you copied the fourth line as we have it three times and then had a Ginla with a uh, jelena and conroy on the first line like it, it the second, third, and fourth lines were all basically what our current fourth line is. It was pretty much and, Jerome Aginla and friends. And Mika Kiprasov. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, it's actually kind of d disappointing that the Flames weren't able to sign Dion Phaneuf. Because they had him in the prospect pool. And if they would have signed him, they could have actually used him. And they, they might have a Stanley Cup from that year because of that. But... You know, instead of playing Brennan Evans or, you know, any of the other guys we had to force in there. But, uh, no, and then, like, in 05, 06, I think the the, the expectations, like, because we won the division that year, it was more like, okay, well, we went to the Stanley Cup Finals, 
so we're just gonna go do that you know and like it, it was more like it overconfidence in that and i think part of that was also having lost the season before that like we had this huge celebration then we had no hockey i remember at that point as a flight fan feeling like okay we're back we're riding the high let's do it again we're a good team now yeah and especially because of the fact that we finally had some players that had some talent on the forward group uh guys like damon lanko uh who's alias tange like, we actually had some offensive talent besides a guy like Craig Conroy and Martin Jelena from 04. And so, like, the expectation was, okay, well, we did that with the spare parts that we had. We're clearly better than that, so we should have a ton of success. And then we lost to Anaheim. In the quarterfinals. And, yeah, and that Game 7 was the single worst performance I've ever seen any team play in the playoffs. The Flames got shut out 3 nothing in that game, and it was apparent from the first period when it was still 0-0 that the Flames were going to lose and lose badly because they just had nothing in that game, and it was horrible. But, uh, yeah, it was... That year, it was a lot of overconfidence. Um... The following year in 06 07, that was uh, the year that they traded uh, Kobasu and Ference for uh, Brad Stewart and uh, Wayne Primo. And they were pretty confident and, at that point. Yeah, it, like they were the eighth seed, but uh, they, I think a lot of people thought, oh, well, we beat Detroit the last time we faced them, so we should be able to do it again. And if it was not for Mika Kiprasov basically being in god mode that would have been a sweep by Detroit <laughs> uh I think he made like 50 saves in each game like it was just a complete mismatch and the Flames came close to even forcing it to game seven but it, that was a complete you, you might as well have had a playoff uh, an elite team versus an AHL team. We don't need That's to recap every season, but none of these you were confident going in, you know, really realistically saying this is our year. No. And like you look at uh, the year that we faced Chicago, I think we were a little bit more confident uh, because the Flames were leading the division for most of that year and slid uh, after Giordano got hurt and faced Chicago in the first round and if not for Anders Ericsson, I still think we beat Chicago in that round. But, um, like, that was the last time there was a lot of confidence. And the uh, then, like, it was just basically downhill and out. And then 2015-2016, we were third in the Pacific. We went into the first round, beat the, beat the Canucks 4-2. to two. That's really when everybody uh, got introduced to Michael Furland. And yeah, I think that that year, I think everybody kind of expected the Flames to beat Vancouver, uh, just because Vancouver was bad, and like we were kind of bad too, and like our division that year just kind of sucked all the way around. I went back and listened to some of our shows from fourteen fifteen, and we all agreed that we were going to lose the Ducks. We just didn't expect it to be in five games. Yeah, and. Yeah, like, that was one where the Flames, like, they beat Vancouver, and they should have because Vancouver was even worse than we were, but you had an, a very good Ducks team, and, yeah, that was... Everybody, I think, kind of knew that that was a... We might win round one, and then we're done. And that's how it ended up being. We had a comment on that, actually, from one of our listeners on Facebook, Liam Ogle, who said, uh, I never truly believed the Flames would make it past round one in any other year than 2015. And even then, I knew we were done in round two and we had to face the Ducks. But this yeah. year's different. I've always, this year's different. So, yeah, I would agree with him. I think that was the year we had the most hope. Um, then, obviously, we faced the Ducks again in 16 17. That's when we had some goaltending issues. But, yeah. Well, like uh, when we faced Chicago and San Jose, like the last two times the Flames made the playoffs in the Aginla era. I think the, each of those series was fairly even. It's just that it went the other team's way. I don't think that like if the Flames had won, they would have gone very far, but they could have won a, another round after the first round 
possibly in each of those cases and i think chicago and san jose did end up going to the conference finals each of those years it's just that unfortunately we faced a really good team in the first round and lost and that's what happens when you barely scrape in yeah and that's why for like ever since then been harping on like you need to be in the driver's seat so that way you can get the weaker team so that way you're more likely to get through round one I think we'd both agree this year feels different. I'm not going to go as far as saying I think this is the Flames' year to go all the way to the Cup or they win the Cup, but I think this is the year that the Flames can at least win two rounds. Of, like, basically any team since 1989-90, this is the team I'm most confident could win the Stanley Cup. That said, I'm not confident that they're going to win the Stanley Cup. Didn't you predict the Cup for us last year? I said that they were going to go far. Uh, I think either conference finals or finals, but I expected the team to basically finish where Vegas did because I I said that our division was terrible last year and whoever wins the division, and I thought it was going to be us, would go far. It ended up being Vegas and they went to the finals. So I was kind of correct. It just I didn't expect the Flames' bottom six to be as horrendous as and the coaching staff as they were and because like i was seeing the good part of the team that like we're seeing this year and like you could see that like they've got it it's just they didn't have all of the parts yet and they got all the parts now they're kicking ass after a big win like this it's such a critical time in the season these guys were in really good spirits when we talked to them after the game in the dressing room let's head down there and listen to what they had to say after ending his slump with a big four-point game, Sean Monahan shares his thoughts on this one. Yeah, it's nice. I mean, it's uh, it's nice to get a win after you get a, a loss on uh, on home ice. So I think uh, the team played well. Somebody had some big saves at uh, good times, and uh, I mean, when you win like that, it's fun. And Monahan talks about getting two goals tonight from that high danger slot area. Yeah, that's that's where you got to score. I mean, especially myself, that's uh, that's where I've scored a lot of my goals. So I think, uh, I mean, get some confidence back, putting the puck in the net, that, that's huge. But uh, moving forward, you look at those two points, and those are going to go a long way. James Neal shared his thoughts on this game and his play and his recent injury and getting ready for the playoffs. I think, uh, you know, of course, I mean, you know, when you're, you're feeling good and, um, you know, your confidence is there, good things uh, tend to happen. So um, it's a good time to kind of get in the zone and have that, uh, have things go right for you. And, um, you know, you work for everything. So, uh, you know, like I said, with an, an injury, I try to take it as a positive rest up. And, you know, I felt like uh, since I've been back, my, you know, my legs are going and, you know, I feel good. So, um, just trying to ramp it up as much as I can and uh, be ready to go come playoff time. I feel good. Uh, like I said, I just took that time to really let my body heal, no, let the injury heal. And, you know, I didn't I didn't rush anything, so I just sat back. Our team is in a great spot. You know, the team's been unbelievable all year. So to, uh, you know, have that and, and not, not have to, to rush back and, and feel like you're missing something, well, it was a good feeling. You know, the second season starts here in uh, four games or so. Well, Matt, I think... Um you know, we'll see what happens with the playoffs this year, but I'm this is the most confident I've been. Like we said, we're not I don't know if they're gonna go all the way, but I think anything that we can do over if we can get through two rounds, this is a really successful year well, for the team. Looking at how the playoff structure is, this is why it was imperative that the Flames finish first in our division. Cause if we finish second or third, then we'd have to play the other good team from our division. And I think it was fairly apparent that Calgary, Vegas, and San Jose were going to be the three best teams from our division, just looking on paper of their rosters. So the fact that you have to play one of those guys in round one, frankly, I think that any of those matchups, it'll be a six or seven game series and a bit of a coin toss. And then if you actually manage to win then you've likely got to go play the other one. So you're like, even if you get through the first round, you're likely going to lose in the second round just because it's it's that much more difficult. But with Calgary winning the division, they don't have to worry about getting bloodied from that. They can 
have an easier opponent, whether it's Colorado or Arizona, deal with them. I was thinking either Colorado or Arizona, we can have a short series, which will let us sit and rest for a couple yeah. of games. And then you have another, t- the other two going to war. And like we saw them play a couple days ago and like it was a bloodbath in the, that game. And I, it looks like the, that series is going to be a very physical and they're going to beat the crap out of each other, frankly. So, and I don't expect that to be like a four or five game series. That's going to be a six or seven game marathon. And then they got to go and play us after that. And frankly, of the two teams, I'd prefer to play San Jose just because their goaltending is kind of bad. But either way, if the Flames make it through the first round, they stand a better chance of beating whoever wins that than they would had they been second or third. And then, frankly, I think that whoever wins our second round series, whether it's us or Vegas San Jose... I think they beat the central team and then go on to the Stanley Cup finals. And if not, I mean, let's say that the Flames bow out early. It's not like this team is built for one year. The nice thing here, as much as I'd like them to go deep this year, we've probably got three, four years with this core. Like, if we can't do it this year, we retool and net and we come back at it next year. And that, to me, is the real... The real positive of the way this team is built is we can we're gonna have the same core for probably three four years. Oh, for sure. And it, just looking at the Western Conference, there's no team that is as well built as the Flames, and there's no team that is as well built moving forward as the Flames. So the Flames are basically destined to be one of the elite teams in the West for the next handful of years. And outside of Vegas, most teams don't make it kind of their first year they go on a run. It takes them two or three cracks yeah. to, to get to the Western Conference Finals or even the, you know, the Stanley Yeah, Cup. exactly. And so, like, say, like, the Flames beat Colorado, Arizona in round one and then lose in six or seven against San Jose, Vegas. That would be fine. I would be disappointed because, you know, anytime you lose in the playoffs, you're disappointed. Because we're number exactly. one. But... You know, you, you'd understand if they lost. But I think that if they get through the second round, then they go to the finals. and Because all of the central teams are more like Colorado, Arizona, where they have structural weaknesses that can be exploited by the Flames, where, like, San Jose and Vegas are fairly complete-ish teams. So I think that whichever will go on, it's just... I'm going to make a bold playoff prediction. I don't think Tampa goes to Neither the finals. Neither do I. I think uh, you could easily see Calgary-Boston in the finals or whoever's in, in the West I think is going to take on Boston. And while I don't think we could beat Tampa in seven, I think we could beat Boston. Yeah. I it, I think that in the East, there are three teams that are the likeliest to make the finals, and that's the Washington Capitals, the Boston Bruins, and the Tampa Bay Lightning. I think Boston easily dispatches Toronto in round one. And I think Washington and Tampa dispatch the wildcard teams rather easily. Um, I don't see uh, Pittsburgh or the Islanders beating uh, uh, Washington in the second round. They could, but I'm leaning more towards the Capitals just because of their more recent playoff experience. And... Boston versus Tampa, that's going to be a war. And then whoever wins that will likely have to play the Capitals, which that will be a war. So I could easily see the Washington Capitals in the finals again because they only have to go through one battle instead of two. Um, similar to, like, us. Like, we, if we had been second or third, like having to play Vegas or San Jose and then having to play the other, like... Tampa's got to play Boston, and then they got to play, say, Washington, or uh, say, Pittsburgh, or say, the New York Islanders. All three of those teams are pretty good. Like, that's hard to do. And then if Calgary has, like, a slightly easier road, they could win. It's it's a total crapshoot, really. It, but it, the Flames have the better odds just due to the fact that 
they're like the only really really complete team in the west and they're going to be less beat up than whoever they take on exactly and so if the flames get there i'd lean more towards calgary just because they'll be fresher than the opposition but it's a jump ball well, the other thing is, as of right now, and it could easily change because I think they're only, uh, I think Boston's only two points back on us. If we take on anybody but Tempo, we'll have home ice yeah, advantage. Yeah, and that's another important thing with wrapping up as many points as possible. And I think the Flames are leading currently against LA, so that would knock the magic number to finish things second overall down to one if they do that. Well, let's talk about a couple minor notes here and then do our predictions and get out of here because uh, it's it, we've spent enough time looking ahead to the playoffs and we need to celebrate that we're number one. Um, fr- long-time listener of the show, Ryan Swanson, we've read some of his tweets before. He tweeted us and said, now that Fox wants to test the market, does that mean the Flames have officially won the trade? So just backing up for those that don't remember, in the summer, the Calgary Flames made a trade with Carolina. They sent prospect Adam Fox. Um, they sent Michael Furland and Dougie Hamilton to Carolina. In exchange, they got Hannafin and uh, Lindholm. So if we take Fox out of the equation, I said right when the trade was made, I don't think he's going to sign there. So if we look at it as a two for two now, Furland and Dougie Hamilton for um, Hannafin and Lindholm. I think the Flames are the winners, no yeah, doubt. Yeah, and I don't see Carolina getting much more than a second for Fox. I don't see any team... Because like, I think that he only wants to go to three or four teams total, and I don't see... like I think he really wants to go to the New York Rangers, and if you're the New York Rangers if, and you have a guy who wants to sign with you, are you really going to spend a ton of assets to get him? I, I wouldn't. Well, that's it. If he wants to go to New York and that's where he really wants to sign, why would you spend an asset to get him? Why would you not just wait for him to become a yeah. free agent? Yeah, and I think that Carolina is not likely going to get very much for Fox. Um, you look at, like, Hannafin and Hamilton. Frankly, they're basically equivalent this year. Like, Hamilton has more goals, of course. He has 15 goals to Hannafin 6. But basically in the points column they're virtually identical but why well, I, I said this when we made the acquisition i mean hannafin was 21 when we brought him in i think hamilton is the better defenseman now i think hannafin's the better defenseman going forward and we were trying to build a defensive core for the future and i think he's he's going to get better every I year i agree and i think that just that was a win for us just moving hamilton for hannafin and then getting Elias Lindholm for Furland, like, give me a break. You know, Furland is a free agent at the end of the year. He's not likely going to sign in Carolina. And if he does, it'll the number will start with a four, which is ridiculous. So, uh, like, you got an 80-point player locked up for five years at, like, just over $5 million. It's like, yeah, we won the trade. <laughs> you. Like, even if you remove Hannafin from the equation, I think we win the trade if it was Hamilton and Furland for Lindholm alone. Adding in Hannafin, it's no contest. Well, let's look at it sort of, you know, forward for forward, defenseman for defenseman. If you look at it that way, like you said, Furland for uh, for Lindholm, no question. Yeah. Hamil- Hamilton for Hannafin, I think you could argue that Again, Dougie was the better player if you're looking to make a run this year, but I think as we're looking at an aging Giordano, Hannafin's the heir apparent. Yeah. And looking forward, like you're more likely to see the first pairing in, say, two years being Hannafin and Anderson, with Giordano being on the second or third pairing, sort of like what Brian Campbell was for Chicago when, they, when Keith and Seabrook took over the first pairing. And yep. then, you know, and his role, Giordano's role, will decline over time and more ice time for the younger guys. Yeah, I think you're totally right. And I think, you know, when you look at it too, people said, well, Noah's had a rough season this year. But I remind people that 
you know what? We didn't have a great looking Hamannick last year either. So it takes a guy a year or two to really get going in Calgary. And he hasn't looked that bad. I I thought he's fairly good for most of the time. Uh, there's been a couple of games where he's had some defensive lapses where you're going, uh, what are you doing? But that every defenseman, uh, like it, Hamilton had one of those pretty much every game. So it, it, Things are a lot more settled with Hamannick or Hannafin on the ice than it was with Ham Hamilton. Too many Ham, yeah, too many no, Ham sure. defensemen. And I, I think, like you know, like we were saying, is we don't need, we don't need Hannafin to be a number one guy yet. He's fine on that second pairing, and I think it's just going to naturally happen that he's going to slide up there. And I think with guys like Anderson looking so good, um, you know, it might even make make a little more competition for Hannafin that you don't want to get jumped over by, you know, Rasmus Anderson or some of these guys. So hopefully that'll help as well. I think if nothing else on this one, we win simply because of the contracts. Like you said, Furlan's going to get a four. We got both of our guys locked in a great deal yeah, long term. Like we have 10 years of guaranteed players from each of those guys, five each. And. Carolina only has three years on Hamilton. Furland's done at the end of the year, and you know who who knows how much each of those guys will want when their contracts are up. And it, I don't see Carolina re-signing re-sign, Furland, uh, especially if he wants four. And I think he will get four from somebody. It's just that yeah, I don't see us or you know any team that has a lot of depth wanting to go that route but he does bring a lot it's just I could see him quickly turning into a Milan Lucic where he just kind of vanishes entirely yeah and I I don't think Dougie Hamilton will resign there after his deal either I think they'll run out that deal and I think he's one of these guys that he's got a sweet deal now but when it comes time to resign it's going to be a very different looking yeah. contract yeah uh, That'll look more like the Fanuf contract when he was with Toronto. <laughs> yeah, I don't think he's going to be as... I mean, Fanuf's bounced around a whole bunch because nobody wants to keep that contract. I don't think it's going to be that bad. But I think he's going to go from being, you know, paid like a, let's say, a top two guy to being paid more like his value will be at that point, which is probably a 3-4. Yeah. And I think there will still be teams that want him for sure. It's not like he's going to be, you know, moved out of the NHL. But I just think that you know, enjoy your contract yeah. now. Um, the last piece of news to talk about this week before we do our predictions is the Flames made a signing this week. Um, their seventh round pick, number one hundred ninety eight overall in twenty eighteen, Dmitry Zavgorodny, who has been playing in Ramuski of the QMJHL this year in sixty seven games. He has 28 goals, 36 assists for 64 total points. Um, this is a guy I know you liked when we drafted him, and we've seen him a few times at the dev camp. He's really looked a lot better than you expect from a seventh-round well, guy. Well, he had that one really good Holinchka tournament, and then his draft year, he kind of sucked, frankly. And nobody really knew what guy you were getting. Were you getting the guy who was like really awesome and profiling to be like a second round pick or the guy who shouldn't even be drafted? And the flames took a gamble on him with the seventh round pick and he's rebounded to looking more like the first instead of the latter. So hopefully he will continue to progress nicely. I don't see him necessarily becoming an NHL player but he will be a very good offensive player for Stockton moving forward and hopefully he can like Phillips and Majapane can start transitioning upwards towards the NHL yeah I agree with you I don't think he's an NHL guy but especially with so many young guys moving up the lineup either into the NHL or playing big minutes in the in the AHL, you need guys to just fill out the roster. And I think this is a guy who can probably have an AHL career. I don't think he's going to be ECHL fodder. He might start there, but I don't think he's, you know, your next kind of Brett Pollock, who's probably tops out at a, at a low end AHLer. I think he can probably have an AHL career, but don't expect this guy in the flames uniform. Yeah. Soon. Unless he has a breakout and which could happen. Like there's enough offense. But even then, I think he's going to be so low on the depth chart. He'd have to have more yeah. than one. And he's 
it has the offensive potential to do so. It's just, I think that if he were to make the NHL, he'd be utilized in a trade more than anything. As like, oh, take our flashy young prospect for your veteran guy that we need more than anything. But we'll see. And it, there's also some rumors on the internet that the Flames are close to signing a couple other Russian free agents. But just due to their contracts, they have to wait until the end of April. Because that's when their contracts come to a close. So... Yeah, we'll wait and talk about those when the deals yeah, come through. because there's a goalie, a defenseman, and a forward that the Flames are apparently close to signing or have signed pending April 30th, but we'll talk about them later. Hopefully we're still doing shows then. Well, let's look ahead to... I, I'm pretty sure we'll, we'll still be doing shows then. Um, let's look ahead to this week of games that mean nothing for the Calgary Flames. We've got... A game tonight in progress against the LA Kings. And if you look at the Flames lineup, a very different looking Flames lineup tonight. They're deciding to start resting their guys. They've still got the main lineup of Goudreau, Monaghan, Lindholm as number one. Bennett, Jankowski, James Neal is your second line. Mangiapani, Ryan, and Hathaway is the third line. And then pulling up the fourth line is Froelich, Quine, and Zarnik. On the back end, Fantenberg, Rasmus Anderson is pairing one. Valimaki Prout is two. Valimaki got recalled from Stockton today. And Shillington Stone is three. So um, hopefully nobody's paying money to see the Calgary Flames in L.A. because they're not going to get the Flames team they're yeah. paying for. Well, the Flames, I think for all three games, are not really in caring mode. Like, it's just let's not get hurt and get the clock ticked down as fast as possible. I think they win one or and I think they win one or two games. Wednesday night is an eight thirty start, a late start here in Calgary for a Wednesday game, and that's in the Honda Center against Anaheim. And then Saturday they're back for the final regular season game. It's a home game against the Edmonton Oilers. So, Matt, we uh, last week you and I didn't do great. We I thought we'd win all three. You thought we'd lose to Dallas and San Jose. We just lost to Dallas, thankfully. Yep. Um, so you're thinking three games, do you know, or you're thinking they're going to win two games? Uh, I'll go with just one and that'll be the Oilers. You think they win the Oilers? Yeah. That's it. I th I think they're wow. in don't care mode. So, you know, and that's understandable. It's like, let's just get through the game. So that way we're healthy for game one. And that's the only thing that matters. I'm going to say, I think that the flames will win both Anaheim and Edmonton. Uh, I think uh, this this game tonight against L.A. We're, what, in the end of the first, and it's 2-2. I think the Flames might win, but I can see L.A. kind of coming for revenge here. And I think we're going to see less and less guys. I don't think that first line is going to play against Edmonton. No. But I, I think it'll still be funny if our, you know, essentially Stockton guys can can win against Edmonton. Yeah. You know, officially, we, we can only make two more call-ups, I think. One. What do you think of... Do you think unofficially we just pack the jet on the way home with Stockton guys? Wait till the seventh and activate them all. Oh, we have an emergency. Seven guys are hurt. Well, but I mean, you know, we're we're in we're in LA and we're in Anaheim. You might as well pull them back from the California trip, even if you don't officially, you know, activate them on the roster. Yeah, could be. And then you serve everybody, you know, bad food on the plane on the way home, so nobody can play against Edmonton. Yep. Or at least that's what you tell the league it happened. Yeah. Everyone's just or, having a nap. Oh, he, this guy, he has a bruise from something. He can't go. <laughs> that's right. He, uh, You can just get everybody, I don't know, if they're hungover, could you say there's alcohol poisoning on the team? Figure something out. That's somebody's job. Probably the same guy who manages the cap. Yeah. Well, it's uh, it's going to be an interesting week. It's again the first time I can remember where we've sat here in the regular season saying there's games that don't matter. Well, we did in our first couple seasons, but that was for a completely different reason. <laughs> Are you going to watch these games this week? Oh, I always watch every game. Yeah. So, uh, sometimes it's a little more on fast forward than others, but yeah. I think that this LA game, and if they keep doing the same thing on the blue line. I think this is going to help them decide who gets that sixth spot. Yeah, I agree. And that's why I think it's a good idea to have those guys all playing so that way you can 
figure it out. And I, honestly, I think that's already kind of decided. I think uh, Fantenberg will be the guy, but doesn't hurt uh, especially like if anybody gets hurt then you know like who number seven and number eight and so on is yeah no for sure and, and i think you know even seeing Valamaki and he he's looked really good since he's been here last time he's played some nights i looked he's played 30 minutes in stockton yeah well so it makes we sense because stockton has no defense so it makes sense well, Matt, we'll talk to you next week. And uh, next week, we're going to recap our predictions from the beginning of the season, see how well we did. As we always, we make some predictions. We'll hold ourselves to them. And we will, by then, know who we're playing in the playoffs and when we we're playing in the playoffs and everything playoff related that we don't know now. Yeah. Which it's likely going to be Colorado, but we'll see. Uh, oh. Colorado did get a point, so they're up to 86. Um, with three games remaining, just like Arizona. So they have a two-point lead. Uh, Arizona does have the tiebreakers. So if Arizona wins two, Colorado wins one, Arizona is who will face. But we'll see. And uh, Colorado doesn't have a very tough schedule. I think their next game's against Edmonton. So that should be two points. All we know right now is we're going to the playoffs and we're going to wear retro jerseys. We don't know when the games are, who are playing. Yeah, uh, Colorado plays Edmonton, Winnipeg, and San Jose uh, as their final three games, so not the easiest schedule. Um, and I'll just check on Arizona. I think they're they're playing L.A., uh, followed by Vegas and Winnipeg. So, yeah, both have a bit of a tough stretch. So, we'll see. So, all things playoffs next week. Yep. All right, well, you have a good week, Matt? Yep. And as always, go Flames go, and now the games matter, so really, go Flames go. We're number one. We're number one. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.